How's that for a 71-year-old emeritus member of the 70? <laughs> Actually, I was really glad when Sister Knight was polling all of your ages and there was someone here that was 94. <laughs> Otherwise, I was afraid I might be the oldest man still standing. And I'm grateful to have this chance and grateful to finally be able to view all of you in, in a conference assembled here. It's so hard, I think, to uh, be a good teacher and not have some relationship with the audience and some familiarity. And so I am grateful that some years ago this was part of my assignment, the North American Northeast area. And, and even during this last day or two, some of you who remember me transiting through in years past have come up and refreshed our acquaintances, which I'm grateful for. Uh, Sister Knight reminded me that 17 years ago when this conference began, I was one of the initial speakers of that inaugural time. Were any of you here 17 years ago? A few? Gosh, that's amazing. Do you remember my dark hair and <laughs> how I jumped up on the stage that day? <laughs> you know, I've been thinking about the value of mentors. One of the things I, I learned just by osmosis at working at church headquarters was that um, <clears throat> almost all of our, our senior leaders have had mentors. Um, President Hinckley was mentored by Stephen L. Richards. He loved the way Brother Richards talked. He loved the way his mind worked. He liked his precision. President Monson often speaks of his mentor, J. Reuben Clark, with whom he became acquainted in the process of helping him publish uh, Lord of Our Gospels and, and other works that he uh, produced during his time in the, in the leadership of the church. Uh, President Packer often talks about the tutoring that he received at the hands of Harold B. Lee. And uh, I think Elder Zabrowski and I would agree that President Packer has been one of the chief tutors of almost all of the 70s. He has taken a real personal responsibility to, to teach us and to correct us if we could take it. <laughs> and if we couldn't take it, then he wouldn't correct us anymore. But it, it was uh, really useful, I think, to recognize that principle. And I've been thinking about uh, students at this university and how blessed they are to come here and work with and under the tutelage of the wonderful men and women that have been a part of this weekend. Uh, what Glade and Kathleen Knight have done for this little university is just unbelievable in a way. I call them the godfather and the godmother of <laughs> Southern Virginia University. And uh, what the Zabrowskis will do in their time um, be hard to calculate. But then these young President Brothersons and Brother Rasmussen and the souls and just so many of the rest of you, the doxies, who wouldn't love to send their son or daughter to President Brotherson to be watched over and shepherded for four years? And I was so grateful that you, you mentioned, uh, President, your, the assurity that you had that you'd been called of God. That's such an important part, I think, of, of being able to be a church leader. And I, I wanted um, just to bear testimony because this conference theme of the heavens being open, I think is such an important one. I compliment you, Kathleen, for conceiving of that under inspiration. There's probably nothing that we could do that would be more worthwhile for each of us than to have a closer connection with our Father in Heaven than we have. But I noticed on the list of trustees of this university that uh, Kent Colton now is on the Board of Trustees. And that's a name I've been coming up against for a lot of years. And I first heard his name when I became married to Kathy Bushnell, who's sitting here as my wife after 46 years. 
and who once mentioned the name of Kent Colton as being one of her former boyfriends. <laughs> and uh, he had been, he was no ordinary man. He'd been the student body president at Utah State and then he'd gone on to Harvard. I don't know if he wasn't able to get into BYU where I was at the time. <laughs> but <laughs> in any event, uh, through the years, as, as our marriage progressed, when it was rocky a time or two, his name would come up. <laughs> and uh, not really. But I'd never met the man until, I don't know, 12, 15 years ago, I was assigned to help reorganize the, uh, the uh, McLean, Virginia stake. Brother Ed Schultz was the stake president, then called on a mission to Munich, Germany. And my companion and I uh, were assigned to reorganize the stake, and as we do, as was done with you, President Brotherson, we interviewed the existing leaders, the 12 high counselors, the six or eight bishops, and the stake presidency, and clerks, and executive secretary, and a few others. There were about 30 or so interviews. And in the course of those interviews, who should appear before me and my partner but Kent Colton? And suddenly there he was, a member of the high council. And I introduced myself as Kathy Bushnell's husband and uh, did it ever so humbly and gently. And uh, we immediately st struck up a conversation about times past and, and uh, struggle as I might against the feelings that came in that moment. It was really obvious that he was to become the next president of that stake. <laughs> And my companion felt the same way. And when we finished our interviews, typically there will be three or four men that will kind of bubble up to the surface and about whom the interviewing brethren will have their strongest spiritual impressions. And I call that getting a few in the corral. And then we talk about them and feel our way through this and then have our prayers and then narrow it usually to one person and then take that name to the Lord. But in this case, in McLean, I remember there was no discussion. There was just one clear person, and that was Kent Colton. And so the next morning, after we had sustained him by way of testimony present, I said to the stake, brothers and sisters, rest assured that Kent Colton was called of God. I said, he used to date my wife, and there is no way I would have called him. <laughs> <laughs> well, he went on to be a very good stake president, darn it. <laughs> no, he had my full support and love and uh, later became president of the Florida Tallahassee Mission, I believe it was. And now he's on the board of trustees of your great university and please don't tell him that I've told this story. But I will say this, that what I did for 23 and a half years, and actually I was a regional representative for three years before that, so for 27 or 28 years, I was gone three weekends a month roughly and gave my life to this movement that we all belong to, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I wouldn't have done it for love nor money, believe me. But I did it and would do it again to know that on any given Saturday, at the end of those interviews, which I participated in over a hundred times in my 20 some odd years, to know that there was at the end of that time an answer that came from outside our heads, outside our hearts, outside our own thinking. It came from heaven. It did come from God. To be a participant in that and to know that that does happen made the whole thing worthwhile. And what I say about that in, on this macro level I think is true and needs to be true for every one of us in our personal lives. If we have a competitive advantage as Latter-day Saints, it's, it's just that. It's that we can have 
that little connection for our own personal needs and edification and guidance and consolation. It doesn't have to be any huge change in leadership. It can just be a prompting to go do something for a grandchild. Someone said to me and says it frequently, what do you miss most about being an active 70? And I, I think it, it's, it's, the, it's the things that you get to do that are so significant, to be a part of things that can influence and help uh, so many lives. And yet, just being with a grandchild for an hour is also significant. Maybe for me now, maybe always, it's the most significant. So I'm very grateful for that connection and very grateful that the heavens are open and very grateful for the wonderful mentors that all of us can be and have to be, I think, in our own individual spheres of life. Well, I have a little message and I know I'm the last speaker and I think it's been so beautifully scripted. You had a chance to rest before me and you have this wonderful brother Minor, a musician to look forward to after me. So in a sense, I'm all that remains now between you and total happiness. <laughs> so I will hurry. And I heard a prescription once for good final speakers, their, their final speeches, they're to be brief and they're to be anodyne, which I understand means soothing, and they're to contain a little humor. I, I hope mine will do all of that, but mainly I hope that it'll have the Spirit of the Lord, because otherwise it'll just be a collection of words, and it won't have much lasting effect unless that Spirit is here and gives life to what I have to say. And I've made it very simple. We've had tremendous instruction. I've I've been to all of the sessions and I've benefited greatly personally and I thank everyone who has taught us and entertained us in any way. But if you can, if you can write down one scripture, you'll have the essence of my talk. It's in 1 Nephi 22. And uh, this chapter comes after several of the Isaiah chapters, which seem to be so perplexing to so many of us in the first part of the Book of Mormon, and after these have been quoted, it, it doesn't surprise me, as it says here in verse 1, and now it came to pass that after I, Nephi, had read these things which were engraven upon the plates of brass, my brethren came unto me and said, what meaneth these things? Who n has not read Isaiah and wanted to say that? What meaneth these things which ye have read? Are they to be understood? according to things which are spiritual, which shall come to pass according to the spirit and not the flesh? And then Nephi answers, and this is the heart of my message. I, Nephi, said unto them, Behold, they were manifest unto the prophet by the voice of the spirit. For by the spirit are all things made known unto the prophets which shall come upon the children of men according to the flesh. Now, according to the flesh is a, is a Book of Mormon phrase that means in mortality, in this earthly existence. So by the Spirit are all things made known unto the prophets, which are going to come to pass upon us, the children of men, in mortality. This verse describes one of the functions of prophets, and it's the seeric function. It's the, it's the function of being a seer. And thanks to the Book of Mormon, we have a, a tremendous definition of what a seer is. It's in the eighth chapter of Mosiah. And it says in verse 15, that the king said that a seer is greater than a prophet. And Ammon said that a seer is a revelator and a prophet also. And a gift which is greater can no man have except he should possess the power of God, which no man can. Yet a man may have great power given him from God. But a seer, 
can know of things which are past and also of things which are to come and by them shall all things be revealed or rather shall secret things be made manifest and hidden things shall come to light and things which are not known shall be made known by them and also things shall be made known by them which otherwise could not be known. So to be a seer, to be a prophet, a seer, and a revelator is really a tremendous responsibility and gift and obligation and in our church office. And we sustain 16 of them, 15 of them. We used to actually sustain 16 when the patriarch was still active in the 1970s. He was made emeritus and we haven't had a church patriarch since. But only one of them at any time has all of the keys active and that's our prophet, President Monson today. And I wanted, old broken down church historian that I once was, to take this thought that by the Spirit shall all things be made known to the prophets which are to come upon the children of men according to the flesh, this function of a seer, and just look out over our history and pick out some prime examples of that happening and then try to find application for that principle in our lives today. So let me begin with one that uh, involves a personal experience. In 1997, a man named Michael Miller, who was then the attorney, uh, the attorney general for the state of uh, Mississippi, came to Utah to give a political speech. But while he was there, he was hosted at church headquarters and he expressed a desire to meet with some general authorities who had also been lawyers. So Elder Eugene Hansen and I were asked to meet with him. And we sat in a large conference room and just talked about his work and his Southern Baptist religion. And out of curiosity, we asked him what he was doing of interest legally for the state of Mississippi. And he said, well, you might be interested to know that we have just brought a lawsuit, he said, against all of the major tobacco companies. And we were interested. We said, well, what are you suing them for? Because as, as lawyers know, and sometimes non-lawyers, you can't just sue anybody for anything. You have to have what's called a cause of action, some legal basis for what you're doing. And he said, well, we're suing the tobacco companies based on a conspiracy theory, he said, because as we've produced evidence, we found that for, for years, over 50 years, actually, the major American tobacco companies have been conspiring together to withhold from the American public the addictive effects of tobacco smoking and especially of nicotine. And he went on to add that their lawyers, the lawyers of these large firms, had also been involved in this conspiracy, which didn't make us very happy to hear, but that's apparently what their evidence, he said, was going to show. Well, can you imagine the thoughts that went through our head when he began to talk about tobacco companies and a conspiracy theory? Luckily, in that room was a doctrine and covenants, and we took it down from the shelf, and we said, you know, you should just know one thing about our religion. We have a book called The Doctrine and Covenants that's a collection of revelations that were had mainly by the prophet Joseph Smith in the beginning days of the church. And you might be interested in reading one of these revelations. It's section 89. And I gave him the uh, Doctrine and Covenants and I said, this, as you're going to see in a moment, has something to do with tobacco. But I said, for now, just read verse four. And he read this. Behold, verily, thus saith the Lord unto you, in consequence of evils and designs which do and will exist in the hearts of conspiring men, conspiring men, in the last days, I have warned you and forewarned you by giving unto you this word of wisdom. Well, Michael Miller was no dumbbell. He got a broad smile on his face and he said, well, I never thought in coming to Utah I would meet 10 million Mormons who would believe in my conspiracy theories. <laughs> now, I obviously am not claiming that that little episode with Elder Hansen and myself and Michael Miller is the fulfillment of 
section 89 verse 4 but I can still remember the little burning I had in my heart that came as he read that verse and as I thought about how unlikely it would have been in 1833 when this revelation was, was received for anyone other than a prophet a seer to be able to look out over 150 years of time and to see what was going to come upon the children of men according to the flesh and to put us in a position to deal with it a warning pretty strong language that he gave us there I know that Joseph Smith saw this and those who have heeded this word ever since have run and not been weary and have walked and have not been faint and then within a few days I was reading a cereal box which is one of the ways in the mornings that I try to increase my knowledge <laughs> and I noticed on this box of cereal something called the food pyramid which caught my attention because as a young man growing up I was taught food groups as the governing nutritional theories of the day but at that point we were with this food pyramid and I I studied this as I was eating my Cheerios and the base of that pyramid was grain or grains and then it graduated up through vegetables and fruits and at the very top of that pyramid were the dairy products which I had helped produce during a good part of my life and I was informed that they weren't as healthy I was kind of glad actually that I was old enough to remember when milk and eggs and sunshine were good for you <laughs> actually they're making a little bit of a comeback I think as long as you don't feed your chickens antibiotics so but there was this pyramid and the base of it was grains and then I looked at this verse 14 in section 89 which says that all grain is ordained for the use of man to be the staff of life now I suppose Joseph Smith could have said to be the base of the food pyramid if he had really been precise <laughs> but prophets are also usually poetic they even write songs if, if you haven't noticed or at least the lyrics for songs so here you have 150 years before the Food and Drug Administration really got on to this this backwoods New York farm boy saying this is how we should live and he says all wholesome, wholesome herbs which we see in the footnote reply, or makes reference to vegetables and fruits in the season thereof and meet sparingly pretty much four square with the food pyramid all again very prescient very much before the time very much before anybody probably really was f interested in the kind of nutritional things that drive so much of our lives today and so much of the commercial market today by the Spirit shall all things be made known unto the prophets which shall come upon the children of men according to the flesh and even today I think most of our doctors would tell us that we need to live our word of wisdom better than we do in the early well in the late 1890s brothers and sisters our church was struggling with debt I don't think it even seems possible to us today but we were borrowing from year to year to operate as a church government does this but our church today especially that would be such in our church today that would be such a foreign notion to be borrowing for our operating expenses but the church was somewhere between a million and a half and two million dollars in debt in the 1890s and it was of great concern to Lorenzo Snow and toward the latter part of that decade 
when we had not been successful in renegotiating the loans that we had with Eastern banks, he made a decision that we were not going to borrow anymore to operate our church, that we would figure out a better way. And of course, the better way was our law of finance, section 119, which had been on the books for a long, long time, but which we hadn't really lived perfectly or even near perfectly as a church. And most of you have seen the Windows of Heaven movie, old as it is, in which Lorenzo Snow goes to St. George and the best report we have of the talk he gave that day comes from his son, Leroy, who was a clerk at the meeting. And he talks about how uh, Brother Snow, President Snow, said to the saints assembled in St. George that they weren't sure why they had come, but they were confident the Lord would reveal to them their purpose in coming in the course of that meeting. And then Leroy Snow, in describing this, says that his father paused and st stood quietly before the congregation for several minutes. And then, almost transformed, he began to speak in a way that was so much more powerful, so much more prophetic than anything he had said so far in that meeting. And he went on to tell the saints that they had neglected the law of tithing and that if they would retrench and commit to pay an honest tithe to the Lord, that it would bless them, it would bless the church, and that the drought, the regional drought that they were suffering in southern Utah at that time, would be brought to an end. Well, the windows of heaven were opened, not just monetarily, but with the weather that changed as well, not long after this. And Brother Snow, President Snow, went from that meeting to a succession of meetings all up and down the Mormon corridor and taught this lesson on tithing. 1900 to 2000, now we're at 2013, this is 113 years ago. Within seven years, it took seven years of this retrenchment to get the church out of the debt that it was burdened with at that time. But from that period on, brothers and sisters, we have been, except I think for just a year or two during the Depression, when we didn't borrow, we lived within our means, but our means were very meager. But other than that, we've been on such a solid financial base as a church ever since. And, um, I, I'm just thinking about an, an episode that I was a little part of. Uh, it's been about 15 years ago when we were aligning with the Catholic Church to, to promote and preserve traditional marriage. And we became very good friends with Monsignor William Fay, who was the secretary of the National Catholic Conference of Bishops, which is their national organization of bishops. And he came and had an interview with the First Presidency and, and, and entered into a wonderful discussion with President Hinckley, who was tremendous in those settings, as you can imagine. And President Hinckley asked Monsignor Fay how the Catholic Church in America was doing. And very candidly at that time, Monsignor Fay said, we're having our struggles, he said, especially financially. We prospered as a church. He said, 80 to 100 years ago, we had to import priests from Ireland, really, to keep up with our growth. We built buildings and cathedrals and hospitals and schools. And now, he said, we can't support them, we can't sustain them, and we have thousands of parishes that don't have priests. And uh, President <laughs> Hinckley said, why don't you try tithing? <laughs> he was just that candid with this wonderful Catholic theologian. And uh, Monsignor Fay said, we've talked about it, we know it's biblical, but he said we don't have that tradition of faith. And then President Hinckley, in a wonderful way, bore his testimony of this law by saying, try it, he said. It's the Lord's law of finance, and it works. Well, it has worked for us, has it not? And if you think about, all of you will have in memory 1990 when the announcement was made that we would do away with all assessments, all special contributions in the church except tithing and fast offering. 
those were the things that we would have an expectation that all of us would participate in. That doesn't mean that our contribution slip hasn't <laughs> proliferated in categories with the Perpetual Education Fund and with temples and missionary and, and other special causes that we've had along the, the way. But basically, the obligations that we have are for tithes and our fast offerings. And we can go beyond that, and almost everyone does. It's a wonderful spirit of giving that I think has come out of the idea that there are no more assessments. I used to think in my mind when I was a young bishop and we were assessing families for welfare and for building fund, did Joseph Smith really say, I teach my people correct principles and then I give them an assessment? <laughs> he didn't say that. So we're completely, I think, on a free will offering basis. But look where that has put us. If you get acquainted with leaders of other churches, and I don't say this at all to demean or to denigrate any other religion because there are wonderful churches and wonderful people, but most of them are consumed by trying to keep up financially, to raise money. Much of what they do is directed toward that. And in our church, because of this tremendous law of tithing that President Snow began to stress in the 1880s and 90s, and into this, that century, previous century, we're on a solid financial footing as a church. We're independent above all creatures. And we live within our means, we have a reserve on hand, and it's a wonderfully secure feeling, I think, to be a part of this institution in that way. Again, what did President Snow see looking out? Did he see the temples that would have to be built? Did he see the missionaries that would have to be supported? Did he see the meeting houses that would have to be built starting in the 1960s when we became really an international church under President McKay and began to, to go across the sea and organize stakes? I don't know what all he saw. And often they don't see the full picture. In fact, I learned in Salt Lake that when we took a, an issue to the First Presidency and, and did our very best to brief them and inform them and seek their decision on an issue, that when they made their decision, especially when it was contrary to what we might have recommended, I didn't ever feel even comfortable about saying why. Because I knew deep in my heart they may not know why. They just may know no or yes, but they may not know why. And I know it was Elder Maxwell, I think, who said the Lord doesn't reveal things in paragraphs. He just reveals them in sentences and words. And really that's, com that's congruent, I think, with what we've learned today, that, that it's here a little and there a little. And I think... One of the most important lessons I ever learned from church history is that revelation is a process, not an event. If we just know that, we can understand how our scriptures have developed and have faith in their authenticity. Well, let's take another issue. That's that of the family. It was 1916 when Joseph F. Smith and his counselors first instituted a family evening even then, there was something stirring in the heart of our prophet about the need to do better with our families, to be more family-centered, for parents to be more actively involved in teaching. I know someone asked me once, what would your children know if all they knew about the gospel they learned from you? A good question for all of us to ask ourselves, whether we're parents or grandparents. I don't think, though, that family was that much of an issue in those teen years of our history. But by the 1960s, it again bubbled to the surface, and we know that under President McKay and his counselors, there was the formal institution of a family home evening as a part of the correlation program that was put together in those years. And... Uh, I remember, in fact, Kathy and I have some of the very first family home evening manuals. We've kept all of those. We're, we're collectors. 
Uh, Kathy even checks the garbage every week before I can take it out to the road to make sure I haven't thrown anything away that I shouldn't. It's nice to have that kind of peer review going on. <laughs> but I'm with her when it comes to books. I'll keep them all, including the family home evening manuals of those early years. 1960 though, that's when a lot of us here were young people. The family wasn't in crisis then. The divorce rate wasn't at 50% then. Same gender marriage wasn't an issue then. It wasn't really an issue in 1995 when the family proclamation was issued under President Hinckley. But what has happened since 1995 concerning the family in America? to the divorce rate, to the rate of children born out of wedlock, to the number of people who cohabit as opposed to marry. Those are some of our most tragic statistics. Some of our, our saddest social outcomes. And much of that has happened, much of that decline has occurred really just in the last 15 or 18 years. Again, if we've just quietly gone about our obedient way and had our home evenings and had our family prayers and read our scriptures together, even if it's just First Nephi, which is the part of the Book of Mormon our family always specialized in, <laughs> we've came, sort of kept things together and had some sense of solidarity that we wouldn't have had just out of those little things doesn't amount to much but the cumulative effect of that within a family over a 30 or 40 year period is just tremendous I mean you take any individual Monday night Kathy and I used to wonder if we'd done more good than harm but now you look back and you can see just all those little building blocks that you laid and you can see your own children laying them now, only laying them even better, having exceeded their parents in so many important ways. But all because of profit, or in this case, profits. And it's interesting how many of these little things I've chosen have this continuing series of sequences to them. Something that one prophet starts, picked up by another, and picked up by another, and then maybe finished off in a way by another through those years with these seers looking out by the Spirit seeing what's going to come upon the children of men according to the flesh and trying to guide and position us to cope with these things to overcome them if they need to be to deal with them to survive them in this world that we live in the Book of Mormon the influence that President Benson had in the mid-80s. Remember when he was called as our prophet? I actually thought that there was only one talk he could write, and it was about the Book of Mormon. The first four or five conferences, it seems like, when he spoke to us as our prophet, were on that topic. And really, it, it galvanized the church. He told us we were under condemnation. He quoted section 88 to us and said that we were still under that condemnation, that we ought to get busy with the book, and we ought to read out of it every day, and families ought to read out of it together. And out of that came really a, a transformation of our curriculum as a church, and a culture of being scripturally based as a church and as families. As much as I love technology and admire all of you with your handheld apparatuses, I'm going to rue the day when we lose our little totes and no longer see our children and us as older people carrying our scriptures in the church. To me, that was always such a great thing. And I know President Packer told us once that in his lifetime, in his 50 years, there were three things that he viewed as the seminal events of church history during that period of time. One was the 1978 revelation on the priesthood and one was the the reinstitution of the quorums of the 70 but the other the third was the publication of the LDS version of the scriptures in the late 70s and 80s early 80s 
And if you think about how that coincided with President Benson's emphasis on the Book of Mormon and what that's done, what was there about those succeeding years that made it so imperative that we became more spiritual, that we, we learned what was in that book and made it a part of our conversation, our teaching, our daily walk? That Christ-centeredness, I think, that comes when you read the Book of Mormon and are infused, really, with a love of Christ and his atonement and a desire to repent. Was that needed for those years? Did he see something by the Spirit that was going to come upon the children of men according to the flesh that only that could prepare us for and help us through? And then you have this temple emphasis that began in the early 90s with President Hunter. He only remained our prophet for nine brief months. But almost everyone, I think, remembers still that his signature teaching and emphasis was on the temple. Remember, he told us to make our temple recommend the symbol of our membership. And in his holy way, I think that had such an impact on the entire church. Small wonder that he was succeeded by the greatest temple building prophet of all time. Here again, here a little and there a little. We got the beginnings of this from President Hunter, and then and we have in the church archives as one of our prized possessions, the little piece of yellow legal paper that President Hinckley sketched out the plan for the first small temple on as he came back from the colonies to El Paso, Texas one day riding in the back of a car. He sketched it out and someone thoughtfully kept that. And I don't know, is it in the president's exhibit now where we, it could be in the museum, but it's either there or in the archives. But again, this tremendous push to build the temples that have been built in just the last 25 years is one of the most amazing developments in the history of the church. A little example, 1998 priesthood session. I remember this so distinctly. President Hinckley drew on the, the dream of Pharaoh that Joseph had interpreted of the seven fat kine and the seven lean fleshed kine or cattle. You men remember that meeting? And then he said this, there is a portent of stormy weather ahead, and we better be prepared to heed it. That sent a little chill down my mind or down my back that night. There is a portent, because 2005, which would have been seven years from the date that he gave that talk, our economy began to take a little different turn, did it not? And by 2008, we were in what we now call what? The Great Recession, which is a very nice way of saying a small depression. We didn't, we've already had a Great Depression, so now we've had a Great Recession. But on that evening, he said there was a portent of stormy weather ahead, and we ought to get our houses in order. And he begged of us to reduce our consumer debt and to pay off our obligations and to live within our means. What did he see under the influence of the Spirit that was going to come upon the children of men according to the flesh? Well, I'm going to conclude here briefly. We have witnessed this week, and I'm actually very excited, uh, our family is going to all be together on the 23rd of June we're going to take a church history trip and we've chartered a bus and 48 Jensen's are going to terrorize the East Coast for nine days <laughs> and the Midwest. But on that Sunday night we'll be in Binghamton, New York and I'm going to find the church and at six o'clock we're going to go hear this missionary meeting. And, and again, if you look at the evolution that Brother Donaldson taught us a little bit about, but to me, it really began with the publication of Preach My Gospel because that, more than anything, 
in the last 150 years probably has had such an impact on the way that we do missionary work, on the quality of our work, on the quality of the leadership that mission presidents provide. Most good men and women, when they were called as mission presidents over that three-year period, were able to come up at the end of it <laughs> with a pretty good way of doing things. But now with the publication of that tremendous book, everybody starts with that at the very beginning. And so the level of what we've been able to do, the level of spirituality, the power that's in the work is significantly better than it's ever been. And when you couple that thought with the fact that President Monson's, I, I think, signature emphasis has been the rescue. I think, and, and, and that wasn't started by him because that was also an emphasis that President Hinckley had. In fact, for the first three or four years of his term as president, he spoke on almost every occasion about hanging on to our converts, remember? And he even told us once in a leadership meeting, I think when I die and I'm about to be buried, I'm going to rise up in my casket and I'm going to ask, how are we doing with retention? And, and we attended his funeral and I could see his casket and I was really watching it <laughs> out of the corner of my eye. <laughs> but isn't it interesting, again, here a little and there a little, that President Monson, and of course that, that's what his life really exemplifies, is that rescue ethic but now he's adding to that I'm sure with the help and counsel of his brethren this whatever it will be come the 23rd of June and to whatever extent it involves the internet which it apparently will I don't know uh, but I do know that in the book of Acts it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times all things will be brought into one. And I don't know what that one is or how we'll ever get brought into one but if a billion people can belong to one network then it's no stretch to bring six billion more. And to have that used for God's purposes some way that I can't see, but I'm not a seer. And what President Monson has seen or what someone after him will see, only our Heavenly Father knows, but seeing they certainly will. And his eternal purposes will certainly be brought to pass. To pass. And I think anyone who sings, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet, has to, stay, has to say, better stay tuned. Better stay tuned. And better heed. How can we sing, we thank thee, O God, for a prophet, and take anything lightly that these brethren teach and warn and testify of? I think to his dying day, Heber J. Grant had a place in his heart that was sad because in the 1930s when prohibition was being repealed and the church took a very strong stand against, the, against repealing the 18th Amendment and Utah, as it turned out in a bitter turn of irony, became the state I don't know what number it was, but when Utah voted to repeal prohibition, that was enough to complete that repeal process. And we were back to a country that no longer prohibited alcohol. And you can argue the political and social and all the merits of that. But the fact remains that the church, a majority of the church members in Utah, went against the prophet's teachings and wishes. And we could be doing that today as well, in our own little ways, unless we stay tuned and we heed. Someone said of a seer that they can see around corners. And that really is what we need in this convoluted world that we live in. Yes, we have 
inspiration. Yes, the heavens are open for each of us individually and we can find our own little ways and we can guide our families and we can handle our stewardships, whatever they may be within the church. But isn't it wonderful, brothers and sisters, to have one man on earth who speaks for God, who by the Spirit can know all things that are going to come upon the children of men according to the flesh and can guide us and lead us accordingly. I'm so grateful to be a part of this organization. I, along with you, have staked my life on the truthfulness of this church and on the veracity of Joseph Smith's story and on the reality of the priesthood being restored and being here today with all of those keys held by Thomas S. Monson. I pray that this talk has given you a little greater perspective and a little greater desire to not just sing we thank thee O God for a prophet but to stay tuned and to heed. May he bless us all to that end is my prayer today in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.